Alright, yo, I want to welcome y'all to today's episode of the Flimlow 5. This is a show where I answer fan questions on a variety of topics about the NFL, the XFL, college football, etc. If you want to be a part of the show, all you got to do, hit me on Twitter using the hashtag the Flimlo 5. All right, today we got a good one, man. Bruce Arian straight dissed Jameis Winston yesterday. John Franklin III had a last chance you flashback. Why didn't the NFL treat Justin Blackman the same way they treated Josh Gordon? An update on the human demonetization magnet himself, Kellen Winslow Jr., and of course, our weekly Antonio Brown madness. Like, what even is this show? without some AB news. Yo, if you enjoyed this series, be sure to click the thumbs up button, share this out to your friends and family, spread the word, man. First time viewers and non-subscribers, consider clicking the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you can be notified every single Tuesday when I drop this series. And finally, we address the OG subs. Y'all already know what time it is, fellas. Cue the way. All right, for topic number one, we're opening up with the reaction from one of our subscribers. Kevin Cabosco had this to say on the Bruce Arians, Jameis Winston exchange. Can you really blame him? Every coach who applied for the position was told they had no choice going into the year as to who would play quarterback. It was Winston or bust. Well, now he's got leverage and you better believe he's gonna use it. What is he talking about? What is he reacting to? Well, I'm glad you asked. Temple Bay Bucks coach Bruce Arians was asked about the kid 30-30 James, a guy who capped off his 30 touchdown, 30 interception season with, of course, a walk-off pick six. I recently asked the question, is Jameis trash or treasure? And Bruce made his feelings abundantly clear on the situation. When asked whether or not he thought the Bucks could win with another QB, he responded, oh yeah, if we can win with this one, we can definitely win with another one too. You better believe that. Wow, shots fired, man down, bro. I'm like, damn, Bruce really not holding back. And he honestly may try to clean this up by the time the video goes out, but Bruce Arians is known for speaking his mind and being candid, so let's just hope he leaves it at this because honestly, we all know what this means. We're not stupid, I don't care what he comes out and says you really can't clean this up and let's keep it a buck man bruce has a point Jameis threw for 5,000 yards and 30 touchdowns sure but passing yards can definitely be an overrated stat especially if you turn it over as much as Jameis. hell check this out the top five passing leaders in the nfl are Jameis, dak golf rivers and matt ryan Notice anything? None of these cats are in the playoffs. Jameis has the highest interception per pass attempt percentage in the entire league. Who has the lowest? I'll give you the top five. Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, Russell Wilson, Drew Brees, and Carson Wentz. Notice anything? That's right, they're all in the playoffs. Now obviously, these are not the only two stats that are important, but it does suggest that the interceptions that Jameis throws greatly outweigh the amount of yardage or the touchdown passes that he throws. Like I said in the last video, he's still a young quarterback and there is definitely a chance that he could clean up some of these picks and be, you know, a top 10 QB in the league if he could do that. But when you hear Jameis speak in interviews, he really doesn't seem like the interceptions bother him all that much. Well, they definitely bother Bruce Arian. That's a fact. And it's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out. All right, man, for topic number two, Rob asked, Flimlow Raps, how bad did Justin Blackman have to mess up to never be reinstated again. Josh Gordon got so many chances. Hashtag the Flimlo 5. Yo, this is an interesting question because Josh Gordon and Justin Blackman have so much in common. They both came into the league in 2012. Their rookie seasons, strikingly similar. 800 yards, five touchdowns for both receivers. Justin Blackman's NFL trouble started the very next year. He only played four games in 2013 for a combination of substance abuse issues and injury. What did Josh Gordon do that same season? He broke an NFL single season record for receiving yards and was named first team all pro. Okay, now they both ran into troubles after that and were suspended from the NFL. They both checked into rehab. They both completed their rehab. After that, they both were denied reinstatement into the NFL. The only difference I can find is that Josh Gordon kept trying to get back in. 
he kept applying for reinstatement. He continued to enter into different rehab centers anytime he felt he needed to. And he eventually won over Roger Goodell and the NFL by being so persistent. Justin Blackman, on the other hand, was denied reinstatement one time in 2015. He never applied again after that. He instead kept getting DUIs, getting into more and more trouble. And he refused to communicate with the Jaguars or the NFL on a regular basis. So while I'm sure they both were doing the absolute most with their substance abuse issues, Josh Gordon, whether he was sincere or putting up a front, he was able to convince the league that he was doing everything in his power to actually get better. Justin Blackman was not able or was not interested in selling that. He was actually getting worse and worse while Josh Gordon at least appeared to be getting better. It may not seem like it now, but these guys didn't have a huge gap in talent. Gordon is bigger, but Blackman was faster, running a 4-4-6 at the combine, and Justin Blackman was way more productive in college as well. And in 2013, when Gordon went off and broke all those records, Justin Blackman only played four games, but in the first two games before his growing started to bother him, dude went for nine grabs and 136 in one game, and then had 14 receptions for 190 in the next. Again, not able to weave it all together throughout a whole season like Josh Gordon did that year, but you definitely saw glimpses, man. The talent was there. And it's extremely weird because Justin Blackman, again, is a first round pick and Josh Gordon came in in the supplemental draft. So you think that Blackman would get more opportunities, but I think the Jags would have still owed him like $10 million if they would have brought him back in. It wasn't about to spend 10 mil on an unknown commodity who didn't even seem to be committed to trying to get better. So being a high draft pick may have actually hindered Justin Blackman in this situation. All right, topic number three, and it's time for our weekly Antonio Brown segment. Like. I might have to get this man his own theme music or his own individual intro or something like that. The first news that came out about AB this past week was that he was working out for the New Orleans Saints. We found out because of course, AB posted the invitation to the workout on social media. After the initial news, everything else went exactly as you'd expect. Saints told AB not to bring an entourage. He shows up with the entourage and a camera crew. The Saints are greatly annoyed by this and kind of wish that they never invited dude in the first place. Then the workout starts and he absolutely blows them away because the man is an all world receiver. And no matter what happens, you can't deny that and you can't take it away from him. So at that point, the Saints are like, damn, I know he posted the invitation on social media and showed up with a camera crew, but this dude is a hall of fame talent. He's in shape and he's ready to go right now. But the Saints don't sign him because if they do, the NFL is gonna put him on the commissioner's exempt list. They may, however, go ahead and go through with it because while on the commissioner's exempt list, a player still get paid as if they was on the active roster. But I don't believe that money comes from the Saints salary cap due to the player being on the commissioner exempt list. Also, it doesn't count against the 53 man active roster limit. So while AB wouldn't be able to practice or attend games while he's still on the commissioner exempt list he would be allowed to be present at the facility for meetings and he can work out and receive treatment and stuff like that so it's still up in the air right now a couple days later i know i got a real aggressive tone lately but really i'm at peace i just don't like the lack of respect in the world you know everyone has deadlines I guess the NFL don't have a deadline for me, so I appreciate Sean Payton and them guys for supporting me to bring me out to work out. But I think it was a publicity stunt for them. Sean Payton know the feeling of being left behind. Not being able to interact with his team. I know I have a team, but it is what it is. We don't seek comfort. We don't make excuses. I'm gonna just keep committing to be the difference because I know I'm the different. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on the beat, I'm gonna work with y'all. I'm gonna go 30 minutes. A couple days later, AB takes to Twitter and bashes his ex-teammate Juju Smith-Schuster. Here's what he had to say. Boo Boo Schuster was really under 500. You bum, learn some respect. Hey man, I'm sorry, but it's funny. It is funny though. 
Now, AB and Juju had a social media exchange back in 2018 when AB left the Steelers and AB, never one to just let bygones be bygones, could not wait to point out Juju's poor season. And I won't lie, I had hella questions about Juju's ability to be a number one going into this season. He's such a likable and popular guy, but his brand may actually be bigger than his talent. And his brand is definitely bigger than his production was this season. With that said, Juju clearly had Mason Rudolph for most of the year. And yo, that dude's trash, okay? This man had the Steelers offense throwing wing tee pop passes, all right? Then in comes Duck Hodges. So that's obviously not great either. Then you factor in the fact that Juju only played 12 games this year and it's only his second season. So yeah, he had a really bad season and there have been receivers like uh, DeAndre Hopkins, for example, who played with a load of trash quarterbacks before Deshaun Watson came, who still had production. But I'm definitely not on board with calling Juju a bum after this season. He might not be a number one. Okay, he might not be a number one. He he legitimately might be better suited to be a number two, but a bum, come on, AB, you tripping, bro. All right, topic number four comes from Normal Noob 99 He asks, Flimlo Raps, how do you feel about the Kellen Winslow Jr. court case now, and do you think he will slash should serve life? Hashtag the Flimlo Five. Okay, Kellen Winslow Jr. Here we go. So I dropped the What Happened to Kellen Winslow video about six months ago. And although there's no cursing in the video, just due to the things this man was accused of alone, that nearly 1 million view video got immediately demonetized. And I don't even blame YouTube, all right? They are 100% right. This dude was wildin', bruh. Kellen Winslow Jr. was charged with all kinds of wild stuff, but in November, he took a plea deal, which will allow him to avoid a life sentence. So he won't get life. Based on the charges he pled guilty to, he's gonna serve between 12 and 18 years in prison. Once it gets out, he'll have to register as a sex offender. He's due back in court in February of 2020, so that's when we'll find out exactly how long he's gonna get. Should he have gotten life in prison for this? It's hard to say, man. I honestly feel like the laws are way too lax when it comes to sexual assault crime. I don't think they're punished harshly enough. If he gets closer to the 18 years, then I guess that's okay. I'm actually more concerned with what happens while, he, while he's there. Is he just locked in a box? This cat actually needs some help, so lock his ass up for sure. But during these 18 years, can he please get some type of rehabilitation? Because the stuff that this man was doing, like something is seriously, seriously wrong with this dude. If you just lock him up for 18 years and then just let him back out to run rampant, he's not going to be able to control himself. He's going to be doing the exact same stuff. So please get him some help. If you want to know everything he was doing in detail, check out my What Happened to Kellen Winslow Jr. video right after this. Okay, bro, it's super wild. So just prepare your mind. Go in, check it out. All right, I wanted to end on a positive note. So, topic number five. Topic number five comes from Macklin. He asks, Flimlo Raps, what do you think about JF3's ability to carve out space for himself on NFL rosters? Do you think he's finally found a home with the Bucks? Hashtag the Flimlo Five. Okay, so John Franklin III has been on several NFL rosters in between the practice squad and the active roster. Ever since leaving college, he's never really been without a pro football job, and most of his jobs have been in the NFL, if not all, actually. He went from college QB to college wide receiver, then got to the Chicago Bears and was moved to cornerback. Now he's with the Tampa Bay Bucks and he's back at the wide receiver position. But as an athletic ex-QB, he was asked to impersonate Deshaun Watson on scout team, and he impressed Bruce Arians so much doing that, that by the time Sunday's game rolled around, he actually got a snap as a Wildcat quarterback in the game. He had one carry and picked up 11 yards, okay? Now, JF3 can come across as a bit arrogant at times, and he gets a lot of hate because of it. He also hasn't really had any notable production over the course of a full season, like ever. Even on Last Chance U, he split time with Wyatt, who was a walk-on at the next level and now works a regular job. With all of that said though, JF3's ability to find a spot or carve out a place on a roster is 
ultra impressive. He always impresses coaches because he'll play any position and he apparently practices really, really well because even though he really didn't have a lot of production, he always seems to impress coaches with his athleticism and his fearlessness and his ability to really just try anything. Anything they ask him to do, he put 100% effort into it. I mean, how many people say he should give up after it didn't work out at Florida State, EMCC, Auburn, or FAU, okay? But he's still finding spots on pro rosters. He was drafted into the XFL, but then got another NFL contract before he even signed with them. So the XFL is still on the table for him if the NFL thing doesn't work out. It's like JF3 is carving out a pro career that reminds me of like a backup singer or maybe like a supporting actor. Somebody like Anthony Anderson, right? Supporting actor for years, he always kind of pop up in these little films. You might forget he was in the movie until you rewatch it and be like, oh, that's Anthony Anderson was in this, I forgot. But dude made a living playing small roles before he finally broke out with his own show. Will the Bucks be JF3's Blackish? That's pretty much the question. I'll say this, I still think the XFL is his best shot to really carve out some staying power. So I'm actually gonna stay with that. I think ultimately his staying power or his blackish is gonna be the XFL, but he does have an opportunity right here with Bruce Arians, but it was added to the active roster way late in the season. We'll see what happens after free agency and the draft and, you know, it's ultimately going to come down to numbers, whether or not they keep him and whether or not he can actually make an impact on the team. All right, man, it's going to do it for today's show. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Don't forget, like and subscribe if you're brand new. I'm going to see y'all next Tuesday for another episode. And don't forget, I have a new what happened to video dropping this Thursday. So make sure in a couple of days you're checking that out. I got a couple more videos popping up on the screen if you need something else to watch right now. I'm going to holler at you next time. My name is Filmo Raps. Peace. Yeah, I'm